Hello, everybody. Uh, good morning, good evening, whatever you are in the world. Well, uh, this is Giovanni Comande, and uh, welcome to our panel. It is uh, a challenging one, uh, as you will see. And uh, we have a, a very uh, prominent and, uh, and very nice panel, a very interdisciplinary one. And you have uh, down uh, the, the list of the speakers. So uh, do not worry uh, about the long presentation, but we have from jurist to epidemiologist to policymaker and uh, uh, of course, data scientist. The panel is jointly organized by the National Institute of Standards and Technology, which is part of the US and by the little lab of Scuola Superiore Sant'Anna in Pisa, and basically by its uh, age 2020 legality attentive data scientist that we are uh, coordinating and for which, by the way, we have 15 opening positions. Uh, all uh, of the speakers that are involved are uh, were in a different way involved in the transnational debate on uh, tracking, alerting, I would say, for the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Different views, different expertise, different implications. Uh, we had uh, several meetings before we started, and uh, we decided in our pre CPDP 2021 meetings to the focus mostly uh, to basically the generalization of the lessons learned and learning during the debate on exposure notification during the COVID-19 pandemic. Well, uh, we all converged on the need to look closer, especially to the infrastructure requirement needed to efficiently gather and share data, preserving, of course, fundamental rights. That's uh, our shared goal. Now, uh, these issues, the interplay between uh, companies, private companies, uh, and how they would interplay with this infrastructure and the possibilities can even, uh, that's uh, a point, a clear point we need to discuss here, uh, shape even uh, to some extent in some countries even determine even public policies on health, depending on the infrastructures and how we would bend on it. Uh, well, all these issues, generalization, uh, raises many technical, legal, and ethical concerns, and uh, we are there for for that. But even before beginning with uh, with with the, with the issues, we would like to understand uh, basically uh, how important uh, taking activity and alerted activity could be in pandemics uh, in general. And of course, COVID-19 expertise and experience is, is key. So we need to have a first, uh, if you want, an epidemiological point of view for this uh, public health policies. And, uh, and, and I think that's, that could be clearly the point in which we definitely need the expertise of Paolo uh, Vines, who is an epidemiologist from the Imperial College. May I ask you, Paolo, to take the floor? Of course, thank you. Uh, can I have my first slide? So, as Giovanni said, uh, <clears throat> I work in epidemiology, um, I, I work in public health, uh, and I, I have tried to put together uh, a few experiences uh, I have uh, had in the course of this epidemic, uh, particularly in it, working uh, uh, with uh, uh, several institutions uh, um, in, in, in several uh, steps <laughs> during the, the pandemic uh, in Italy. Yeah. Uh, so, first of all, I would like to talk about uh, prediction. Uh, and I think that uh, uh, a good way to start with uh, is to, to refer to uh, meteorology, because uh, meteorology uh, uh, made uh, uh, big uh, uh, steps forward uh, in uh, uh, the 70s, essentially. And what I want uh, to emphasize uh, here is that uh, meteorology, prediction in meteorology, uh, weather forecast, is based uh, on a kind of cycle uh, between observations, uh, theory, and uh, modeling. Uh, that is, uh, uh, a large number of, of observations are made. Uh, uh, this leads to data assimilation. Uh, then, uh, based on the laws of physics, uh, this leads to, to models, uh, uh, intermediate results. Uh, uh, everything is put uh, into an archive, uh, and uh, uh, forecasts uh, are allowed. But, but what is important uh, is uh, an interplay between uh, uh, models, uh, theories, uh, and uh, um, data the collection of data. 
So this is a, a, a model uh, that uh, we use as epidemiologists, uh, is a typical prediction model um, <clears throat> based on uh, um, different uh, uh, stages. Uh, the, the, the population is uh, subdivided of uh, susceptible, uh, uh, um, exposed, uh, infected, uh, um, uh, th then uh, uh, recovered uh, or people who have died uh, and uh, susceptible again. And, and this goes uh, in a way in, uh, in cycle. It is uh, uh, dynamic in, in time. Uh, so these are called uh, uh, SIR models or SERIR. Um, well, I, I will not go into details. I just want to, uh, to show that there is an iterative process uh, because the subgroups uh, uh, change all the time. Uh, the, 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 at, at the start of a pandemic, every, everybody will be uh, susceptible, of course. Uh, then you will have a, a, a small proportion of people who are exposed. Uh, uh, some will become infected uh, uh, and so on. But what I want to, uh, to stress here is uh, on the uh, right side uh, top of the slide, that is a contact matrix, uh, because uh, this is a what we are discussing today. Um, in this case, this is a model uh, colleagues of mine have developed uh, in, in our region, in Italy. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, contact matrices uh, were based on assumptions. That is, uh, um, uh, they, they made assumptions about uh, the degree of contacts uh, uh, between people, uh, among people in different uh, categories like uh, different uh, age groups. Um, so this uh, uh, is crucial to make uh, uh, predictions uh, which are realistic, uh, because uh, if contacts uh, are completely uh, abolished, uh, uh, like uh, in a complete lockdown, uh, let's say, which is a theoretical uh, situation, you, you, have, you have no contacts and, and then you, you make a certain prediction. Uh, then you, you can uh, set uh, your contact metric, matrix at 50% uh, of contacts, of the usual contacts, uh, or 20% or whatever. Um, and so you come to uh, this kind of predictions, which are a combination of uh, uh, the effectiveness of uh, uh, decreasing contacts, um, and uh, uh, on the uh, ability to identify the cases. Uh, well, obviously, uh, one of the problems is uh, case detection and uh, contact tracing, uh, identification of uh, asymptomatic uh, cases. Uh, so depending on the combination of these two um, axes, uh, um, you, you can make different assumptions. Uh, uh, you, you, you see that uh, um, on top, uh, you, you have uh, <coughs> uh, different levels of contacts, uh, uh, different levels of the contact matrix uh, um, variable, uh, and, and which is uh, um, uh, compared uh, with uh, the effectiveness of, of contact tracing or case detection and contact tracing. So you go from uh, uh, an extreme situation, which is uh, top left, uh, of uh, uh, essentially very limited uh, uh, or uh, uh, no ability, uh, basically, uh, to, to detect the cases, uh, very limited. Um, uh, uh, no, sorry, uh, very limited. Uh, and uh, um, um, uh, also limited ability, uh, limited uh, um, uh, uh, ability to decrease the contacts. Um, down to the um, bottom right, uh, uh, where you have uh, uh, maximum levels for both. So maximum levels to detect uh, cases and their contacts uh, and uh, maximum ability to decrease uh, the contacts uh, based on, uh, on the uh, assumptions uh, on the contact matrix. So this is, uh, uh, in a way, it is a theoretical. It, it can be improved uh, with uh, actual uh, Sometimes uh, the actual observations are not uh, made uh, in real time, and that's why uh, we would need uh, tools uh, like mobile phones uh, or uh, other tools uh, to, to measure in real time 
uh, people's contacts, uh, particularly mobility of the people. The next one, sorry. Yeah, so uh, I just want to say um, one word and prediction models, because uh, uh, to be sure that uh, they serve a society, uh, you have to be careful. In, in a very, um, in a nutshell, this is what we say in a paper we have published uh, with Andrea Saltel and others in Nature uh, last June. Uh, basically, we, we say that uh, uh, politicians uh, shouldn't re use uh, uh, the models uh, as a, a truth, uh, uh, as, as a scientific truth, uh, but they would should be careful uh, uh, and be uh, aware of the implications, uh, but also of the assumptions uh, and limitations of the models. But also modelers uh, uh, shouldn't project more certainty than their models deserve. deserve. Um, uh, in, uh, in other words, uh, there should be a kind of interplay between uh, uh, scientists and, and policy makers. Uh, uh, under the, the awareness that uh, prediction models uh, uh, have limitations and are based on assumptions as those I, I showed, like the uh, uh, contact uh, metrics. The next. Yeah, um, this is an example of uh, use uh, uh, of mobile phones, uh, um, uh, which was done uh, in a optimized uh, way by Professor Dino Pedreschi at the University of Pisa. Uh, it was uh, extremely useful uh, to uh, track uh, uh, the mobility of people during the pandemic. Um, uh, so it, it showed uh, uh, several uh, different interesting results. Uh, one was that uh, most likely mobility is one of the main determinants, if not the main determinant of the spread of the virus. Um, and th 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 there was a very good uh, uh, overlap between uh, the areas of great mobility and uh, the areas of uh, uh, quicker, more rapid spread of the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> the is that you can also um, some way estimate uh, the impact uh, of uh, uh, measures uh, of contained pandemic like uh, the lockdown and this slide in particular uh, shows uh, the relationship between the number of cases that arose in different uh, regions of Italy and uh, the timeliness uh, of the lockdown. So uh, as soon as uh, um, uh, the lockdown was uh, implemented uh, in certain regions, uh, um, you, you, you saw an effect uh, on the pandemic, but also you see that uh, uh, when the lockdown was implemented uh, uh, before the, the pandemic uh, uh, reached uh, its uh, full expression, uh, like in, in southern re regions, uh, uh, there were very few cases in the first wave. Uh, this refers to, to the first wave. Uh, whereas in, in uh, uh, regions where the, the uh, lockdown was implemented, uh, when the pandemic uh, had already started, um, the, the number of cases in the following uh, weeks uh, was very high. So this is an example of how uh, mobile, uh, uh, the use of, of mobile phone information in an anonymized way, in an on anonymous way, uh, can be uh, extremely helpful in uh, um, understanding uh, the spread of the pandemic uh, and uh, helping uh, the surveillance uh, and other functions. So you, you can add uh, to this kind of uh, uh, picture uh, allowed by uh, mobile phone uh, information other layers because you can use uh, geo-referenced uh, residents, uh, residences of the COVID cases. You can use the productive structure of the territory uh, as described, uh, for example, by the local work systems of uh, ISTAT, the National Institute of Statistics. You can also geo-reference uh, the characteristics uh, of the territory, uh, of the built environment, uh, and link it uh, to uh, residences of, of the cases, uh, to mobility, 
uh, and in general have a, a, a picture of uh, the, the complex relationships between uh, people's behaviors, uh, uh, mobility, and the spread of the epidemic. Can, this can be done retrospectively um, to, to study, so to say, the, how the epidemic uh, spread, but it can also be done uh, uh, prospectively to uh, investigate uh, the, um, uh, the, the onset of uh, uh, clusters, for example. This is, this is an example of cluster analysis in Vietnam, uh, where um, work has been done to uh, identify early on clusters uh, of subjects uh, with COVID. Um, and this uh, may allow the uh, preventive services to do, uh, for example, contact tracing and, and, and stop uh, um, the uh, further spread, uh, the, the, the early clusters uh, that can be stopped uh, from uh, uh, further spread. I, I stop there. I think that uh, I, I, this, this uh, is work in progress and uh, uh, it would be nice to, to have a discussion about uh, this kind of uses of technologies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paolo. Uh, well, I mean, if I can simplify, maybe to oversimplify, uh, tracking data I mean, are important. Information and mobility are basically uh, the key because they enable to choose the degree of lockdown, for instance, that should be taken. But I think you gave us very important warnings that are uh, very well related to what we are doing here because uh, as long as more accurate are the data and more accurate are eventually predictions that still remains models so no out of fate on them as you as you recall uh, still uh, the more accurate are there the more is the risk for individuals or to be for instance re-identified with all the consequence on on, uh, on 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 their rights and 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 basically this uh play had been uh, at the key one of the key arguments for saying that health had a sort of privilege over data protection so we have to protect people that somehow misleaded the debate and indeed your example from from dino from what we, we have done in pisa uh dino predreski uh it's, it's clear because there the mobility study was at the level of granularity that basically fully anonymized if you want to the extent still possible today uh, the data so there was no re-identification possible but still some hints in the direction where it could work so basically that's a, a, a technical practical uh, example of the fact that we can work even with mobility data uh, by definition uh, leading to re-identification at the level of granularity that would prevent re-identification so thanks thanks a lot for for uh, for uh, putting this very clear because also uh, you and i want to stress this for our general discussion you stressed uh, a real creep of the even the idea of using models for prediction risk of the abuses by political parties or, or anything to establish or to push forward uh, a specific agenda. All right, thank you very much. We laid the ground for everything. And, uh, and at this point, before we reach more in deep the, the ethical perspective and uh, let's enlarge the picture. So uh, we are learning from the COVID-19 experience and the idea is to enlarge. Now, uh, this kind of tracking can be done in different ways. And uh, uh, we have to avoid the risk that they make become a sort of default surveillance of population. But can we do it? What are the concerns? And I think on that, the NIST, René Peralta, has, has uh, some very good insights to propose us. René, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, should I share my, my screen here? Yep, I think the slides are coming from uh, the organization. Oh, OK. Um, Okay, so I'll briefly talk about uh, what we have been calling encounter metrics at this. Uh, next slide, please. Our, our motivation here um, early on is that we see that the US was massively unprepared for the pandemic. And we really 
would like to be better prepared for the next pandemic. Uh, thinking about the problem, we, we have been framing this as uh, we would like to have the ability to measure the levels of interaction in a population of autonomous agents. Next. Uh, so in, in human populations, the higher levels of interaction means faster spread of infectious diseases. So we want to measure uh, the levels of interaction in populations. Uh, besides enabling uh, automatic contact tracing, uh, we want to help engineer environments so as to slow the spread of disease. So, you know, the layout in a building, for example, affects uh, the level of interaction of its occupants in ways that are really hard to uh, predict in advance. So we'd like to have tools to measure uh, what do, uh, how does the layout of a building say affect interaction. Uh, and so, you no, know, we, we'd like to do this, but we don't want to normalize surveillance of human populations. And that is a you know, very uh, strong concern of ours. Next, please. So what we've been calling in counter metrics, uh, it tries to um, count or measure what we're calling encounters. This is when two people coincide in space and time. Uh, not necessarily simultaneously. For example, we can think of two people coinciding in, in, in this space-time window by one riding an elevator immediately after the other one. Okay, so we want to detect these encounters, label the encounters, evaluate their length or their severity, and aggregate and derive in Next, please. Uh, so, th there's a problem that requires mitigation, a problem that is present in the, um, the Apple-Google uh, approach to this, which led us to not, not use the Apple-Google approach at, at NIST and not recommend it either. So, we're constantly exposing our identity to machines. So when you're in front of a uh, security camera or traffic camera, uh, face recognition software might very well be you know, identifying you. When you swipe a credential for accessing you know, a building or, or, uh, or an elevator, uh, again, you're, you're exposing your identity to a machine. When you use a credit card or at the, AT, uh, at the uh, bank machine, you're doing the same. So if you, at the same time you're broadcasting these pseudonyms, which is what's being done in, in you know, most of the applications for contact tracing now, uh, then these pseudonyms can be linked by these machines. And in the contact, in the context of contact tracing, uh, systems that will expose the pseudonyms later by saying, say, person with this, this pseudonym was infected, these may also be exposing their identities. And this problem requires mitigation. Uh, the, our formulation of, of how we want to, to engineer contact tracing uh, goes a long way towards mitigating that, uh, that problem. So I picked, uh, privacy is very hard to define uh, and it's a very broad topic. Uh, what I did here is I picked uh, three uh, principles from a open letter by a large number of scientists. Uh, on this uh, on this matter. So the, the principles are the system must be used for public health. Uh, they must not be collecting uh, data that they don't need. And uh, can I see the uh, slides again? 
Okay, and the solution must be uh, fully transparent. Uh, protocols and their implementations, including subcomponents provided by companies, must be available for public analysis. So those three uh, principles uh, are you know, very reasonable and one always agrees with them. But then, you know, you think about them and I think it, it, for the first one, if the app must be used for public health, then it is problematic if the app is subordinate to commercial processes and constraints. If the, uh, if the app uh, must uh, not be capable of collecting data it doesn't need, then it is problematic if the system is installed on top of a surveillance platform such as current smartphones. I don't, I'm not sure exactly what phones are allowed to do in, in, in uh, Europe, but what they're allowed to do in the US is, is pretty awful. Third, uh, if, uh, if we're supposed to, to, if the solutions are supposed to be transparent, then it is really problematic if we're not giving low, given low level access to the platform. For example, at NIST, we simply cannot uh, do, uh, implement our, our designs on phones because uh, Apple and Google will deny us access, the access we would need to do that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rene. And uh, as promised, you gave a number of insights, a lot, for our discussion. Uh, I'm, I'm still hearing you. Okay. Uh, to, in short, basically, to track, we need to interact with the environment. So it's not a tracking device or technology uh, alone in the world. And often those tracking tools are related to other de devices, uh, databases, and that's where the risk lies because there could be a uh, more easier uh, re-identification. Now, uh, if I understand it correctly, I mean, your approach, the NIST approach to that sounds like a music to EU, experts at least, uh, because you use the language of the minimization principle, for instance, and transparency. Uh, but once again, this goes to the core element in the battle between approaches. You gave the example of uh, using a mobile phone, which is used for a number of other things, even uh, without the, the awful things you mentioned in the US that are gathered. Still, I mean, you use your mobile phone to pay, to, to, to read the newspapers and so on and so forth. So at that point, there is a key risk that would bring, but uh, probably uh, we won't have the time to dig in that, uh, and a number of other issues. Because uh, if you do not accept extensive access, you might be impaired in actually using your phone. So that's, that's a problem because you won't be able to read your favorite newspapers, for instance, or, or do uh, all your uh, shopping online on your phone. So that goes uh, also at, uh, producing an interaction with the consumer law that has a clear, clear impact. But as you mentioned, uh, the point is how these pseudonyms are broadcasted. And on that, I think we have a lot of lessons to to learn um, from the experience we had from COVID and actually in the so-called battle of models and approaches on which Carmela Troncoso uh, was a key uh, element at the forefront. Uh, so uh, my question for you, Carmelo, is basically uh, do, do we have lessons learned with this issue so far and, and what are the perspectives from the technical uh, point in view of uh, broader infrastructures to deal with tracking in the future as well. Uh, thank you, Uh I'll try to, to answer a bit of that with, with my experience in this big adventure that has been the COVID tracing apps and, and there are a lot of lessons to be learned. Uh, I guess my slides are coming. So what I want to talk about is how we got here and, and a little bit about where is it that we got to, which may or may not be what we imagined. So when we were brought into this problem, the idea was that contact tracing is, is, a key, is a key basis for stopping pandemics, as we have heard many times, but the traditional way has been overwhelmed by the sheer amount of cases. So technology is there to help. And the proposed solution 
and I must stress that this was not that we proposed to push up. The proposed solution that came was to use an app with the idea of leveraging phone sensors because the pandemic was here, technology had to be deployed at the speed of light, so we didn't have the time to go and have new infrastructures that could make things better. And with this problem got to us, we actually didn't hear we want to build an app. What people wanted is an infrastructure to leverage the phone sensors because an app is this thing of phone. But in order to build these contact tracing apps, we need um, a full infrastructure that uses the network, that has a backend, that has a UI towards health workers so that they can put health information on the system. And while you start putting all of these pieces in the cluster, you also go with many dependencies. The first one is that when you say an app, you now are dependent on the mobile OS providers. And this is absolutely regardless of which is your protocol, centralized, decentralized. They own the, the, the operative system, they own the sensors, and they will decide how you can access them or not. You also will depend on how cloud infrastructures are built. Because it turns that these apps, we want them at an unprecedented scale worldwide. So countries have to build this thing. Countries that so far don't have such huge infrastructure. Most of our infrastructure, even governmental one, is privatized. It runs on private cloud. Especially the health system has little infrastructure of their own. As a result, some of the apps that we have nowadays, different countries in the European Union even have their cloud part running on the Amazon Web Services because otherwise they could not implement. And all of this creates dependence. And these dependencies is why it matters. Because once we have an infrastructure, the infrastructure is still hard to remove. It's like a road. Once we build the road, you know, and we just use it to get from one place to the other, people remove them. The road is there. And even if, you know, ages after we have a highway that goes, the road will still be there and people will still be dependent. And also, infrastructures are hard to control. Rene already spoke a little bit about it. So once we have this data, there is no way we can really stop how it is being used. I appreciate very much, uh, and there was in the previous panel a lot of talk about, okay, as long as data is used only for the purposes, well, but data is there. And when it is there, how can we, uh, stop it from being for something else and in the while these apps were being deployed we have many examples some here in my slide about how this data whether it was collected by the apps or it was collected by other means like uh, pen and paper forms it was used again and again by private entities or by public entities like law enforcement for crime fight so it is not the case that we can really have a lot of control was put out there. And it's with this in mind that uh, we tried when we made this design from the pbb 3 d team to assume that we can also try to move. So what are the things that people typically try to use? Identity, location, because location reveals a lot about identity, also reveals a lot about, uh, about people, and also relationship. Who talks with whom, how often, how uh, frequently, how long are these interactions and support and so forth? And what we did is to decentralize any operation that was associated to this to make it. And with this, we um, also want to achieve something that actually is in all of these speeches that we hear about that data should only be used in better purpose limitation by default. The app is so limited in data that actually is only useful for proximity notification. And that means that, yeah. We did not have epidemiology used for research data. But what is what we had considered, if we go back to the first version of provide people actually had their functionality. Through the uh, development, it was clear that the Bluetooth data is very noisy and would not be useful for uh, epidemiology. Actually, at some point, we had a conversation with the epidemiologists and they said, we will not make decisions based on this data. So while I, I appreciate and for research is very important. We cannot use non pharmaceutical intervention that is there to as a research tool. I'm extremely happy if any epidemiologist wants and comes to me to design for them privacy preserving means of doing research on the pandemic. But we cannot conflate 
Because once we complete, we're back in the previous part. We have an infrastructure that we are not able to control. And the way in which this is built, it means that if you want to augment the work, you have a high cost because you need to make changes in the infrastructure. And the bad thing that the infrastructure has is that one, it is a small leaf, but the good thing is that it is hard to change. So now we want to augment, collect more data, do more things. It needs to be obvious. You cannot do this stuff. And by also eliminating all of the data identity, location, and relationship, we increase the cost of abusing the data. And Renee again gave an example. Sure, if you have a camera now in front of a place that also has a Bluetooth sensor, you can link. But now the amount of times that this can help is much, much smaller than with any of the other approaches that are out. Of course, it was possible because we need minimal information going around if one app uh, an app such as so. So where we are now, okay? We, we really produce a limited infrastructure. So it's very hard to do with infrastructure. We have anything else other than these notifications. But we still are in a power imbalance. Very we have strong dependency on the uh, mobile operating system, Google and Apple, and that means that they have all power. And we have seen this again and again. We also have that because they are there, they could also become app developers making this exposure notification express and getting themselves embedded in the health infrastructures of any country. Again, this is not, I think, especially because we actually created this particular protocol, but because this is on an app, this is a mobile system. The fact that some states in the United States went for the uh, exposure notification express is not because they like the privacy because there was no way they could develop it in any other way and at the end they were and i also want to know that the fact that they are in control of the operative system and they can kind of limit how we access led to api decisions that influence both the amount that the epidemiological decisions that we could make on the app and also the privacy that the app get and them. i'm happy to uh, talk about this in the questions i don't want to delve into this other than they actually had a different. And also we have that apps have, have limited impact. They do have uh, some good effect. Uh, we know that notifications through the app get like half to one day earlier than notifications through the phone, which is good. That's one of the goals that these apps had to, to really get break infection chains earlier. And we also have evidence of uh, augmented reach that it reaches people that don't live in the same household and they have never been called by a company. Now, adoption is very low. So um, that means that maybe the effect is not as much as desired because we don't reach as many people. Why is adoption low? It has nothing to do with the protocol. Some people say it's not needed. People amazingly say also, my privacy. People are so used to that whenever you have an app, you have so much data embedded on it. But now it doesn't matter to have any protocol. It's not trusted. And of course, we have the people that say there is no COVID one way to install. The other part where we have limited impact is because the integration in the health system was not easy. So uh, all of this infrastructure to actually have doctors giving information to the app did not work so well. So we have a lot of delays that are not really about the protocol and were things that were really, uh, maybe not thought through or with not enough time because it had to be developed at a speed that maybe was not the best. The good news is that, as I said, it does have a good effect. And also that even if we have this bug, at least this bug is now in the open. But the first we really could see Google and App capture a market like behind, in the front of our eyes. Normally these things happen in the back and then have hearings in the United States year after talking about it. This happened in real time. So, um, and the other uh, good thing is that we had um, a limited surface of attack. And we still have them having apps and then having uh, the, the, the apps, for instance, in the United States, but not data for the abuse. Like imagine Black like Matters, imagine the capital fire if all of the apps put out there an infrastructure that would actually allow people to learn more about connection. Would this actually be stop? Would it not? So I think that this is very important. So what do we go for here? I think that we're looking ahead, 
we need to realize that everything we build kind of creates an infrastructure in the back. And it, we need extreme care to make sure that this infrastructure cannot be abused, not only by law, but also by technology. We need to make sure that we need to do fast deployment. And for this is very important what Renee is saying that to be prepared for the next time. We need uh, to be careful because the speed may bring speed marriage with tech providers, not only Google and Apple, but as I say, others that may be involved. And divorce is a lengthy, hard and painful process. One, it is there. We don't know if we can get away. And also when you fast deploy, maybe the environment is not being prepared. And this was a little bit the case of the apps, this lack of adoption, or this lack of good integration. And this is why it's very, very important that the purple limitation is considered from the design of the system so that when the system may not get the results, may fail, you don't have other damage just because the system can now be turned into something. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Carmela. I mean, the, you gave us a, a very clean picture that I would say to some extent scary. Uh, it is clear as it was to many of us during the debate in the first wave of the pandemic that the whole discussion on up yes, up not was misplaced because the key element was exactly the infrastructure leveraging uh, eventually the uh, the apps and that uh, was once again the argument using in balancing fundamental rights so uh, you, you you touched on, uh, and basically asked a number of questions to all of us already I mean putting on on the, on the floor well, one element is the control of the infrastructure as you clearly demonstrate I think but again there is a function creep there issue I mean the risk of abuses of collected data uh, and that can be always done, no matter how secure, how large is the granularity that is involved. Now, uh, you, you basically asked a couple of questions that I think it's it's uh, it's important to bring to the open uh, because they also goes to the policy matter uh, that will be next. So. Uh, protecting data is possible technically, but increased cost. And in any event, it doesn't take avoid any risk or entirely the risk of abusing that. So one key element, one, one issue for the discussion is whether or not cost is a deciding factor. Uh, time was a deciding factor as well for the marriage you mentioned with the big company. And one other issue I think for the discussion is there is a clear and uh, well-known imbalance with big companies. It rebalance it building alternative uh, infrastructures. Final, and that's I think a key for policymaker that uh, opened the floor for Estelle, uh, it's how can we technically and, and legally avoid path dependency, what economists would call path dependencies. When, once you are married to an infrastructure, there are costs of getting out, your metaphor of the divorce. And this is a key element in, uh, to be kept in mind uh, to develop uh, next generation tools to protect ourselves from pandemic. So uh, a lot of promises uh, have been done uh, and have been put forward. Uh, have all uh, been kept? I mean, all promises were fulfilled. Uh, how was the impact on this and how it could be in terms of policy making? What's your point of view on that, Estelle? Thank you, Giovanni, and thank you also um, to Carmela for highlighting already a lot of very important points uh, for this discussion. Uh, I'd like to focus on three specific points that you just both mentioned. Um, first is where we are now in the EU regarding the use of those contact tracing apps after uh, one year more or less of their development. Two, what does the building of these app meant for the tech company's power and what should be maybe the policy response to this? And three, what can we learn also about the development in uh, outside the EU and the way those apps are being used, reused and repurposed. So we've been living in this pandemic uh, for a bit over uh, than a year now, sadly, and um, governments and companies work really quickly to um, develop exposure notification apps through, um, although the evaluation of the necessity of such tool um, still remains a question. As Carmela mentioned very quickly, um, 
a lot of people came to all of us saying like we will be building an app but there was not a pre-conversation of whether the app was the, was a necessary tool to do that even though there is of course an agreement that contact tracing is very important in the case of pandemic and it need to be increased and developed further uh, as the number of cases was um, skyrocketing so the the epidemiologic need of contact tracing and the need to for the public health response was there the need for data is also there and the question was then how to use it and so we still don't have the full answer at this stage of whether an app was needed and whether or not it has really helped in the response in one year later uh, we also still hear that many countries are lagging behind on just doing normal contact tracing because even though you have an app or you have other system you still need another infrastructure behind as Carmela mentioned to be able to make those to be able to reach out to people and make sure that there is a follow-up on any exposure notification um, we do not have at the moment uh, updated numbers on the uptake of all the apps developed by the different EU countries. We had several numbers after a few months uh, here and there. There is no harmonized number on how it's going, but we do know that there is a vast in the vast majority of country, the numbers remain quite low. Beyond the legal consideration of whether or not those apps were needed, their development uh, raised and continue to raise a lot of questions for the protection of fundamental rights, including the right to privacy. In many EU countries, there was at least a conversation on the right to privacy, and we would probably be in a worse situation right now that if the protocol like the DP3T, for instance, did not exist. And there was a lot of work done by Carmela and others in making sure that at least we would have safeguard in place for a model that was pushed on us, even though there was not a prior discussion of whether or not this model was the one, the app model was the one that was needed. And so thankfully there were um, privacy by design approach taken and there were also um, in most countries decentralized approach. But this was not a European wide decision. If you look at the case of France, for instance, they chose to build their own app with their own model, which uh, is a centralized one. The UK also had several hiccups in building their own apps. Uh, and in Spain, there have been a long lasting scandal about the transparency around the digital specification of the app and several changes that may or may not happen on the system. And during the summer, we've seen an additional issue with the functioning of this app when we are working as a European Union, meaning that the apps were not interoperable between it and couldn't work across border, which is a, quite a problem when you want to also make sure that you track movement of people, not just within a country, but of course the single market. And this may have implication not just for your fundamental rights to privacy and, and data, but also for your freedom of movement. And this is increased also at the moment with additional debate about new tools that countries are considering about you know, immunity certificate, vaccine passport and others. So we need to make sure to also learn from the app experience when we're having those conversations and first show the necessity and discuss also the infrastructure. Um, in order to try to respond to the interoperability issue between the apps, the European Commission has created the a gateway service where EU countries who have more or less similar standards can uh, add their app to the system and work together to try to make them a cross-border. Based on the information on the um, commission system at the moment, it seems that 11 apps from 11 countries are part of this interoperable system. And um, still also based on this information from the commission, we do know that there is at least two countries, France and Hungary, who will not really be able to be part of this system because they chose um, a centralized model that does not, uh, that is a barrier for this interoperability. Uh, we have asked together with Liberties, the uh, European umbrella organization that represents human rights NGOs across Europe, uh, we've asked further clarity, clarification to the European Commission on how this gateway system is functioning, how exactly the interoperability is working, because even though apps may be using a similar protocol, they're not really built in the same way. They may not be collecting exactly the same amount of data. So we're just asking question of who is keeping this merged data and who's the controller and what, what is the information about that? Um, and we're still waiting for this clarification. Which bring me to raise um, the second issue, which was, um, discussed mostly by Carmela on the infrastructure behind the app. So I just mentioned one issue with interoperability, but obviously a big issue when government decided to do an app was the dependence on big tech. So if you do an app, it needs to be delivered, meaning that you need to have an app store that delivers it and Google and Apple control those app store. So 
of course, it's great that when there was a decision to do an app, everyone was super happy that Google and Apple were keen to discuss privacy standards and protocol that could be used, even though not all of them could be fully audited. And some of it, it we still have to trust that they're doing what they're telling us to do because we can't check that. Um, but the reality is, is because of the choice of device, the choice of tool, an app, we needed to work with them. Like government, we had no other choice but to talk to them if they wanted their app to be put on the app store so that people could use them. Um, and these big tech company, not just in a, not just Apple and Google, by the way, are not just dominant in the app delivery market, but also in the cloud services and in other software that also needed for all of this system to function. Because obviously, as a user, you may only see the app, but there is a whole infrastructure behind it. And we are dependent on those companies to make it work. Um, and I know there is a lot of work being done on also embattling the infrastructure and what it means um, for companies' power, but also for people's rights and for even government's authority and government's responsibility on their other side. Carmela just mentioned it. And there was also a great presentation at Privacy Camp earlier this week by Seda Gorsdath, who presented the work of um, her and some of her colleague at the University of Delft, looking into the power that this company hold over infrastructure and what could be changed to develop a more sustainable shared governance model. And so basically what has happened to the internet who was also built to be, uh, or to the web to be um, open, free and secure and for all is also happening, happening to the infrastructure model where it's slowly becoming more and more privatized, which has direct consequences on people's rights, on government's ability to do their jobs. And it also adds a competition aspect to it as it's always the same few company that have different shares and different, um, different powers on those, on those infrastructure. Which leads me to uh, my final point on um, designing better governance model for the future. Um, now, I know Michael will touch on some of some key European legislation coming up, so I'll, I'll leave him to do this big policy unpacking. But we do need to look at how also other countries are, um, they've been developing contact tracing, what we can learn from it, and what maybe are the safeguards that we can put in place in addition already to the one that was developed uh, here in order to, to avoid the scenario. Um, so when we talk about the quote unquote, return to normal life post pandemic, which hopefully will happen. Uh, we need to ensure that this is not just about us going about our lives and bars are opening, but also mean that rights that have been restricted during this pandemic, whether or not justified, um, needs to be regained. It means limitation that existed needs to be lifted. And it means that also tools that could be turned into surveillance devices needs to be stopped using and the information that was collected that is no longer needed needs to be deleted unless it's for specific health connected purpose. This may be basic to say we're no longer in emergency mode, therefore let's restore the rights. But um, we're often, often told as privacy activists that we create doomsday scenario, that those things will never happen, that we'll be just being too alarmist. And this is a pushback to the safeguard we try to put in place. And then suddenly when it happens, government rush to us and be like, okay, help us. What are the safeguards here to put in place? And we did this, but we didn't see this and this and that. And so this conversation needs to happen the other way around, not at the moment that we're seeing in some countries like Singapore, for instance, where the COVID app was developed, one of the first countries to do that. And now the data can be accessed by law enforcement, which is something that we really, really warned from the beginning. Carmela mentioned it also in her, in, in her speech. Um, that purpose limitation was key. This is to respond to a public health issue. This is not about law enforcement. This is also not about tracking for advertising purposes or any other reason. This needs to be used for a clear purpose and we need to make sure that when the data is no longer needed for that, it stops. There are also countries where the apps were built and developed by the ministries of interior. So from the get-go, they were done to be able to monitor people and to surveil them. And this is really not responding to what was presented as the need for those app. Um, so this, weirdly enough, might also be another area where I actually see the power and the prevalence of big tech companies because we're dependent on them on the infrastructure. Government might even go, might even go to them to get access to this data and we might need to rely on them as Camilla, citizens can, to push back. Can you go to the conclusion because time is running up? Yes, sorry, I'll just Thank conclude. You. So um, the last point is that 
you may be telling me like, okay, you're talking about Singapore, you're talking about other countries, but it's not because we're in the EU that those abuse cannot happen. And that's why safeguards are important and the discussion on necessity are important. We saw in Hungary how mention of GDPR rights during the pandemic, uh, during the, the first wave of the pandemic, and this is just unacceptable. It was not necessary, it was not needed, and um, it needed to be restored. And so really when we're going to have this policy discussion of what it means to going back to normal, what it also means, what are the safeguards and what a lesson that we learned from that is that we need to lift all of these emergency measures, restore the rights, and make sure that we have those conversations about necessity of the tools and ensure that they are not being repurposed for surveillance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Estelle. I mean, you had, you had opened uh, a, a notion of, uh, of questions. Uh, we have no way to track whether big companies are keeping their words. Uh, there are differences that are purported where between democratic and non-democratic countries we should control. And you, your last example about Hungary show that uh, the rule of law cannot uh, be taken for granted uh, at any rate, at any time, in any country, even in within our EU uh, borders, uh, but and so you you laid the ground for uh, for uh, for Michael intervening on these issues and specifically on the on the legal dimension. But let me remind that we do. We, you said clearly that we lack data on the impact of the apps on on everything, and that's true. But we do have data on. Uh, to some, to some extent, and this is to, to provoke uh, all of you. Uh, meanwhile, a number of, uh, of questions are putting in. Uh, in Italy, it took days to reach uh, a few millions uh, people downloading and, and, and working and at least enabling and downloading the app in Muni. It took a few hours uh, for a, a lot of people to give a humongous amount of, of personal data just to get a 150 at most cash back from the state. And this was done actually when the app was collapsing in, in giving all those data. So definitely there is an issue also on how the public debate on these issues have an impact on eventual whatever technology, whatever approach we have in this uptake. But that's a time of rules, Michael. Can you give some words on uh, the issue we decide to move forward on the infrastructures and whether or not to what extent the GDPR can be a sort of gatekeeper for the future in our digital markets and digital markets acts, global governance acts? Thanks, everybody. Michael, you have the floor. Thanks. So uh, I, with, with Carmela, I was part of the digital uh, team working on these issues. And I think uh, as Carmela has laid out uh, importantly, any app, regardless of how you undertake it, is a public-private partnership with uh, a large technology company, and it has to be treated as such. Uh, and I think we make no apologies for designing as much of a purpose-limited infrastructure, because that's what it is, within the infrastructural constraints that are present from such companies. That's all we can deal with because uh, democratic governments have long abdicated their willingness to govern infrastructure. Indeed, they've benefited from it, seen it as something free, all these devices in people's pockets that they can, uh, that they can potentially make use of for delivering public services without actually having to invest. All uh, no need for, for to create a global governance infrastructure. Sorry, I, I could hear some noise there. Um, uh, no need to create some global governance infrastructure because uh, it was already, it was already uh, it kind of you know, held by these companies, deputized by them. So we work within those difficult constraints. And we also work within the context of many countries around the world, this is a global pandemic, uh, not adhering to human rights and having significant privacy problems, as well as you know, risks of persecution, the real dangers of a centralized contact graph. And we're designing you know, with the best intentions, privacy by design, data protection by design drawn from the GDPR um, uh, when, we were, when we were working on this area. That said, what this saga has revealed is a total crisis for data protection law and it's abject failure and it's revealed uh, how it's this, the data protection law is going to be failing in coming years. And I'm a data protection academic, I'd love for it to work, but no, and let me explain why. So one of the reasons is that this technology, you know, the technology DP3D system that we designed here, uh, it is very, very good 
at, at uh, preventing uh, data leakage, preventing um, people being identified in practical and, and doable ways. It is actually, though, an indication of the kind of power that infrastructures can wield while totally sailing around the GDPR. Because it is not clear that information that is processed by exposure notification or DP3 T falls at all within the GDPR's definition of personal data, despite it being an infrastructure where you notify individuals of potential risky exposures. This is quite a, a this is entering someone's private and personal space in terms of autonomy, in terms of what they should expect. Maybe it can link, lead to legal sanctions. You know, this is a, a, a consequential infrastructure, and it's meant to be because it's a public health intervention. And public health interventions are meant to be consequential. But what we're seeing here is a, a, a infrastructure where, where um, uh, sensors, mobile phones, can plausibly claim and say, this is uh, privacy by design. We are processing data that cannot be linked back. Uh, at no real stage is it feasible to link this data back to a natural person at scale by a cloud provider or by some other provider because it's been designed that way. There's a few points where you might think, oh, it could come into data protection as a technicality. But when we're talking about identified or identifiable personal data, uh, this information is not clearly falling under that, that uh, category. Centralized contact tracing clearly does. It's uh, in identifiers that can be decrypted to an identity. But in, this, in, the, in the DP3T and exposure notification systems, that is not the case. So you slip out of the, the material scope of data protection law quite quickly. Uh, when you do a proper rigorous analysis of the technologies and any approach to pull it back in appears quite tenuous um, and, and definitely not uh, something that you want to build a regulatory foundation on, like saying mm, you, maybe you got, you got your IP address when you uploaded your identifiers when you were infected. Maybe that was how it's personal data. Well, that's not actually relating to uh, the, the use of the tool. So personal data, we slip away from a bit. Data controllership, it also forms a crisis for. So we've got a lot of interesting case law from the CJU that says you don't need to see personal data to be a data controller. So privacy enhancing technologies are not taken out of scope here. But when we're looking at the role of Apple and Google in uh, taking academic research, deciding to deploy it in the infrastructures that they control, uh, adapting it, changing it, making design choices that maybe as Carmela indicated, weren't always ideal. Um, it's clear they're exerting control over data processing, but it's not clear that this data is personal data, and they're certainly not seeing this data, um, but they are enabling a function. Why this is interesting, and I think what's very important that this pandemic uh, reveals this, is that these are the exact kind of technologies these companies are looking to deploy for understanding populations, for delivering advertising across populations within infrastructures they control like Google Chrome, uh, for targeting, micro-targeting, in ways that do not clearly fall within data protection law. Now, there's some argument you can make under actually English law they might fall under. There's some case law on individuation, singling out, uh, for example, the recent Bridges case around facial recognition and the case Vidal Hall around um, safari workarounds. Um, but this is not very clearly upheld by the Court of Justice in its, its case of Brea, which is very famous. And we'll see where the jurisprudence goes here. Either way, we, we suffer because it's not clear that we can label operating systems data controllers for everything that happens on a phone. Um, uh, and it's also not clear that we can label uh, uh, personal data protection uh, as being, uh, as, as being the, the tool that could help us uh, uh, reclaim these infrastructures in a more democratic way. So where do we go from here? Well, I draw attention to the Digital Markets Act that the Commission has proposed contains uh, uh, provisions around opening up app stores, uh, ability to, to get access to sensors in hardware or fundamental APIs. It's going to run into a very, very long period of debate. Uh, this is going to be heavily litigated. It may never see the light of day in actually installing a third party app store on Apple or in practice enabling APIs to be accessible in the same way as they are to Apple to third parties. And even if it does, we hit the original problem that DP3T was trying to fix, which is that there are different countries, governments around the world that do not follow human rights. There are data protection regulators that are feeble and pathetic uh, and that will not stand up, especially in times of crisis, for human rights. 
we cannot rely on them. So we end up back to where we started, deputizing large infrastructures that do our privacy governance for us because governments have stepped out of the way. And that is not acceptable. We have to outrun to a global governance regime where human rights are enshrined while we open up infrastructure. You can't have open infrastructure um, without a, a form of, of governance of some type. And we don't have governance of anything but the tech companies in this space. And that needs urgent fixing and the GDPR does not help us do it. Michael, we don't hear you anymore. I've, I've stopped talking, that was the end. Yeah, okay. Thank you very much, Michael, also for keeping the time. That's uh, very intriguing what you said, basically, uh, that it's that there is a larger problem of impact because the infrastructure as such, the idea of using this technology can be the problem. Now, uh, we have uh, nine minutes left and uh, we, a number of questions uh, that you have already seen they all are very interesting maybe we don't have the time to discuss all of them i think that federica lucifero and gian claudio malgeri uh, somehow converged on asking to all of us especially to carmela whether or not they it's the only way to to deal with the, this infrastructure with an infrastructure by using apps or we can use and apply the dp3 uh, approach to further uses What's your take on that, Carmela? Please be, be short, everybody, so we can take more questions and more angles. I think this is an excellent question, right? Um, so the question number one is, can we use the infrastructure without apps? Let me go back and say that we built the infrastructure for the apps. Okay? So the infrastructure that we're using are already kind of the apps and the phone. Now, the question is, can we do sensors outside of the mobile system? Now, this is a very good question. I'm actually not sure that at this point in time with the mobile is so embedded in our lives, we could do that. What it is clear is that back in April, it was impossible to ship, uh, sort of to ship, right, a sensor to everyone to have on their houses. That's why apps, uh, I guess, were the preferred thing. Um, but no, I don't know. I don't know what kind of infrastructure would actually work in on a project trying to, to investigate that and try to make a, an estimation of the cost that that would be and answer your question, which I'm with you. Thank you, Carmela. Is there anyone else that wants to intervene on these uh, points and, uh, and issues? No. Well, yeah, go ahead, Renan. So, uh, at least at NIST, uh, the U.S. is not a place where where we th we thought we could deploy these things at scale. Uh, so we at NIST we have developed you know a device that is very small and, and you can uh, uh, we can build it for under ten dollars and it will do fancy crypto, it doesn't have the capability of storing uh, much information and we can use it for what we call contact metrics. But that that, that implies uh, uh, scaling down of the scope of the application of, of, of that tool. I, I have no, no solutions for nationwide uh, deployments. Thank you, Renee. We have a few minutes, and I think there is a clear question to the, our as jurist uh, by Aiste that it's uh, uh, just adding to another question, basically whether or not we consider the GDPR as uh, a master of nothing, so uh, as toothless at this point. And that, I think, it goes uh, not only to Michael, but also to the possibility of using the technology actually without having personal data, so not identifiable ones at this stage of technology. So it goes back as well to Carmela and and uh, uh, and Rene. Uh, Michael? Uh, I think the GDPR is toothless because no one enforces it. That's the main thing. <laughs> um, but the, uh, but it, it's, it's not wholly toothless. It's the, the point is that tackling on process, it, we imagine, everyone talks about your know, companies, these companies are so eager to get everyone to talk about data and pools of data, to get everyone to imagine that the risks of society is from people accumulating data in one place. Now, sometimes that is a genuine risk, 
but it's not a risk to them because these companies don't see data as an asset. They see personal data as a liability. They see, uh, they, they desire to optimize over personal data, to target, to personalize. But if they can do that without seeing personal data themselves, it frees them from content moderation, it frees them from warrants, frees them from limits of surveillance law, from worries about data transfers. And they can do it through controlling the infrastructure and that's their business model and they want to distract people from that. And I've seen CPDP over the years be drawn in to this, this let's talk about data, the worries of big data, sweeping up data, data giants, it's nonsense. That is not the worry of the coming decades. The worry is infrastructure. And we have to get real about this because GDPR does not tackle infrastructure. And insofar as it doesn't, it will fail to protect people and their intimate lives and their autonomy. Thank you, Michael. And if I may add on that, basically uh, the whole idea of the GDPR uh, is that uh, it only applies to uh, personal data. But these days to apply a model developed by companies or for, for what matters by, by the state as well, uh, there is no need to have actually personal data to trigger it. Uh, the old picture of a dog in front of a monitor uh, complaining about the, that uh, he is not anymore anonymous, it's uh, uh, old because you can be treated as a dog, although you are not a dog as long as the model developed applies to you. So definitely uh, the GDPR, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not enough to tackle the infrastructure. And uh, we have to wonder whether somehow we have to extend uh, beyond the strict notion of personal data. We have another two minutes. Is there any other intervention uh, on, uh, on, uh, from the speakers? We have another question I see from Paula, when, when we speak about necessity of exposure notification apps, it seems that we still consider such apps as the main tool in tracing COVID contacts, which is not the case. Um, uh, so the, the point is, uh, is it possible that the potential issues were exaggerated and thus formed a negative public opinion on such apps? That was my, my point on that. Uh, um, so this goes really to everybody. You have the last two minutes. I say mine. I think uh, there have been a misplaced debate on that, but the risk for privacy in, in abstract were not exaggerated. Uh, most probably there was too few information about what was actually going on. And I can talk from my experience uh, in the COVID task force, governmental task one on that. But I leave the floor to all the other speakers uh, I also have to say that from my position where I, by certain deputy, got to talk to many governments of my position and the task force in Switzerland, I don't think that anyone considers the app the main tool for contact tracing. It is still a good tool and it is something seen as the kind of the last barrier once the contact tracing in person fails. These notifications is the only thing that exists. A couple of countries after Christmas when the third wave actually only have notifications via apps. So those are the few chains that are broken. And I'm with Giovanni, like the concerns as expressed very well by Michael were not. This is not only about privacy. Again, it's about power and control and the amount of power and control that would have these apps could have given if not restrained. I think if I could add to that, um, the UK at its early stages of developing a centralized app, England rather, and not the UK as a whole, had desires of using an app as a dashboard to control an entire population. And, uh, you know, I think personally it's very good that did not materialize. It's also what happened when this system failed. The track and trace system changed hands to a different person. It failed in different ways. But um, they came and looked at what the health minister was doing, riding surrounded by groupthink of technology people saying apps are going to solve this pandemic. And they were horrified, and I think that's why they, they, uh, they really they, 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 they stabbed it because that is not how it was ever intended to be. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. I think we have been cut off uh, at this point. So, I mean, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Michael. Uh, our time is up. Uh, so, unfortunately. We have to cut it here, but I think as we discussed that uh, this this group uh, shall be meeting somewhere else 
trying to keep going this discussion in the public. Thank you very much for all, to all the speakers, to all participants for very intriguing questions and enjoy the rest of CBDP 2021. Thank you very much. Thank you all.